Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag with a theme. About 24 hours ago, I posted on the YouTube community tab and my Twitter, at Gil underscore Gross. I told you guys, just like I always do, to leave comments so that I could respond to them, but I made a rule. I said, you can't ask me about tennis. No tennis questions allowed in the spirit of offseason. And... Um, I got many of you. I got many of you asking very interesting things. So, uh, this is going to be another two-parter. Part one, about a little over 30 minutes. Part two, a little over 30 minutes. Uh, that will be released over the course of the next two Wednesdays. Before I get into it, um, if you've missed it, I still have part one and part two up of the season ending mailbags where I did answer a bunch of questions about tennis to, to wrap up the season. And if you haven't watched, uh, make sure you've seen the 2022 Monday match analysis awards. Go back. If you haven't watched those videos and make sure to check them out as well as part one and two of this one cross court tennis. What's your biggest passion outside of tennis and what music do you like? Have you got any playlists on Spotify or album recommendations? I hmm, Okay, I'll get to the second one in a second. Okay, so the first one. My biggest passion outside of tennis is probably food. That probably consumes the most airspace uh, between cooking and exploring the restaurant scene here in LA. Especially the restaurant scene that, uh, you know, is close to me. That is probably my biggest passion outside of tennis at this point in time. Now, other sports are definitely a big one, although they used to be, as we'll probably get to at some point in this mailbag, they used to be a little bit bigger in terms of how large they loomed in my day-to-day -day life. And I'm passionate about music. I mean, so are most people, but I, I do love music. Uh, so you want to know my Spotify album recommendations? Well, let me, let me say what my Spotify wrapped is. All right. Does that work? I do have playlists on Spotify, but honestly, I stopped listening to playlists and I stopped curating playlists. There was a time where that's how I listen to music here. You're going to learn more about me. Uh, I am now an albums listener. I listen to albums. I don't listen to playlists. So I'm not going to direct you to any playlists because at this point in time, my playlists are outdated. A lot of music that maybe I'm not so into anymore because I, I stopped curating my own playlists. But uh, it is something that I used to do. Now I am an albums listener and sometimes I listen to Spotify's daily mixes. Um, I don't memorize my Spotify rap, so I'm pulling it up here. So my top artists... Uh, number one was the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They released two albums in 2022. So that gave them a, a huge leg up. Like last year, uh, another artist that I, I really like, Lana Del Rey, she released two albums in 2021 and she was my top artist. Like if you just by matter of volume, you're doing pretty well. But I will say the Red Hot Chili Peppers, going back to like my really early childhood days, has always been one of my favorite bands, um, even though. I understand their musical shortcomings. And if you're like a Chili Peppers hater, look, I get it. I get it. But I like them. Uh, Arctic Monkeys was number two. I actually discovered their old stuff this year. And that's why they're so high. Because uh, I, I wasn't really familiar with their really old stuff. And I got into that. Uh, but at this point, you're probably thinking, Gil loves rock. Gil's a rock guy. Uh, my number three artist is Kendrick Lamar, who released uh, his new record. Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, which I actually didn't like listen to that much uh, because to me, it's not the most re-listenable album, uh, but I'm always playing Kendrick. It doesn't matter. Old Kendrick, incredible discography, so much there. So uh, he came in at number three. Uh, number four. <laughs> number four was weird. I mean, Amber Mark, you guys probably don't know her. Uh, I, I can't believe she's number four. I mean, she released a record that I really liked this year, but she's not even in my top 15 favorite artists. Uh, Tyler, the creator, number five, another rapper, really like him. So there's my Spotify wrapped. I hope that gave you kind of a flavor. I love Anderson Pack. I love Brockhampton, rest in peace. I love um, 
Yeah, I'm going to end it there. Okay, next one. Asim Joshi, how to get into tennis commentating? Well, there is no clear answer to that question. Um, there are unfortunately not a lot of jobs in tennis specifically because in other sports, there are far more jobs. Uh, for example, if you want to call baseball, there is a massive minor league system. If you want to call basketball or football, there are hundreds and hundreds of Division I universities that play basketball and football. Uh, but tennis, it is so limited, which is why you know I consider myself so lucky to have been able to uh, carve out a, a beginning, a start in this career. Um, and another challenge in tennis is that you have a lot of former players who are trusted with the technical abilities of uh, of the play-by-play -play role. Whereas in a lot of sports, the former athletes are strictly doing color commentary and you have uh, non-former players in the play-by-play -play role. In tennis, that is not always the case. Uh, but, you know, in this case, it's, it's all about, you know, I, I don't know how old you are, Asim, but I would say go to a university that has a lot of opportunity, not only inside the classroom, but even more importantly, outside the classroom to get a lot of practice and repetitions in commentary in general and sports broadcasting. And that is how you get better. That is how, you know, you build a, a reel and, um, you know, there are a lot of things you can do now in terms of taking advantage of the internet, which is what I did in sort of an entrepreneurial sense. There aren't as many barriers to entry. So there are ways that you can kind of get yourself out there and make a name for yourself. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know how much my YouTube stuff uh, helped me get in with Tennis Channel. There were, you know, some other factors um, that that were at play. Um, but you know, I, I left Syracuse with a reel that had a lot of different things on it. A lot of tennis stuff, partially YouTube, partially covering, uh, Syracuse women's tennis on ACC network extra, which is an opportunity I got at Syracuse, which was really, really good experience. Um, you know, those are the kinds of things that I would try to get yourself into. Uh, from Jacob in an alternate universe. When you were not involved with tennis, what would your career look like? And then the second part of this is about my girlfriend. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, well, if I wasn't in tennis, for, for the longest period of time, I didn't think I'd be in tennis. But for from a very young age, I knew I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. I wanted to be in sports. I wasn't going to play. I wanted to try to stay near sports. I mean, every broadcaster has the same dumb, boring old story that it, it almost gets tiresome to even hear it. Uh, but I thought, you know, I wanted to be at a certain point like a Stephen A. Smith or a Colin Cowherd, you know, have a talk show, give my opinions. But then uh, later on, I kind of evolved from that and I wanted to be a play-by-play -play broadcaster. I wanted to be a Mike Breen, a Doc Emmerich, uh, a Dan Shulman, an Ian Eagle. Uh, I don't know, just to throw out some names. Uh, you know, I wanted to be a play-by-play -play person. And, you know, what happened with tennis is because I had the internet stuff going and I developed a reputation at Syracuse of being a tennis guy and online I had that niche, opportunities, and because not a lot of people have that, uh, because you know, hundreds of kids go to Syracuse wanting to be a sports broadcaster. Very few have that distinguishing quality of loving tennis and knowing tennis. Because I had that, I had a leg up in that area. Because I had a leg up in that area, a lot of opportunities ended up naturally opening up for me in the tennis space. And all I was doing was taking those opportunities. I was not always like determined to build a career in tennis. And I'm still very determined to uh, have some diversity in my in my career. Uh, where, you know, at this point in time, and this could change, at this point in time, I, I don't want to only do tennis. So the 
the boring answer to that question, if I didn't have a career in tennis, I would be involved in other sports as a broadcaster, plain and simple, other sports. Uh, but if you want to say, if I wasn't a sports broadcaster, what would I want to do? Um, I'm going to still, I'm going to stay in media here. I kind of can't imagine straying too far outside from, from what I do. Cause again, since I was very young, I wanted to do this. I would say like pipe dream again, this is really hard to do, but I would be a, a food writer, probably food critic, you know, that, that seems freaking awesome. So I'll say that. Uh, the second part of Jacob's comment, I'd like to know the story of you and your girlfriend. How did you meet, decide to be a couple, and how long have you two been together? We've been together a little bit over four years. We met at Syracuse. We don't remember meeting, which is kind of the funny part of that story. Because my girlfriend does the same thing as me, she's also in sports broadcasting, uh, but she's a little bit different. She's a reporter, sports reporter. Um we were getting involved in the same things, the same kind of extracurriculars. So we just kind of knew each other and we ended up, you know, being in a lot of the same places at the same time. So we don't actually remember meeting. We just were kind of, we knew each other. And uh, yeah, I don't have like a cool story, but um, we ended up, the, I guess the funny part of the story is we ended up being... Uh, beginning of my sophomore year, cast as co-hosts on on one of on a show on a TV show about Syracuse. We ended up being cast as co-hosts, and I actually was not uh, not really that happy about it because I was into her, and I knew that I wanted to try to date her, and I became nervous that if I struck out, if I swung and missed that it was going to be really awkward and I was going to have a situation where the on-air chemistry might be an issue. Plus, it might be frowned upon, uh, you know, because she became kind of a close co-worker even to a, to a greater extent because we were literally on the same show together. Uh, but it ended up being uh, her asking me on our first date. That's how it ended up happening. Uh, because she was in a sorority and she had date night and she asked me to go and it went from there. That was our first date and uh, that became our anniversary even though we weren't like officially official after that. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. That's the backstory. From Max Gill, can you talk about the LA food scenery versus New York? What are LA food things that you as a New Yorker could get on board with? And what can't you stand? So I put this comment high up because, you know, you're really uh, playing into my, my sweet spot here. So in terms of individual cuisines, very simple, very predictable, won't be surprising for you guys to hear. Uh, New York, I mean, pizza and bagels are the two biggest things that are very different things that I miss. Okay. Things that I can't get right now are really three main things. The cheap sandwich deli, the sandwich deli that does, it's like a poppy seed roll. It's your bacon, egg and cheese on a roll. It's like five bucks. It's not this gourmet, you know, $12 breakfast sandwich. Uh, same thing for, you know, your chicken cutlet sandwiches, just those kind of sandwich, those cheap hole-in-the-wall sandwich delis. I really miss those. Uh, I miss bagels. You know, the bagels in LA, regardless of what people say, they are not there. They are not up there. And the pizza is not bad in Los Angeles at all, but it's different. You can't go in there and get a New York slice. You can get Neapolitan pizza. There's a lot of really good pizza, but it's just different. We're talking about usually whole personal pizzas, you're spending between $17 and $25 for a pizza. New York, you go in, two $4 slices, maybe five, and it's like this quick, cheap, on-the-go meal, ready in five minutes. Totally different experience in LA. Um, in LA, though, the, the cheap, quick food, right? The cheap, quick food is the Mexican food. It's, you know, a lot of... 
a lot of the Mexican food really takes the place of, in my opinion, what the pizza and the sandwich delis of New York, the function of that is to be quick and not spend a lot of money. And maybe you don't have to, you know, sit down at all these places. And in, in LA, you know, that those are your kind of street tacos and your um, more casual uh, Mexican places for the most part. Um, also in LA, and I'm sure this is kind of available, you know, this is in Manhattan if you go in the right areas, but, uh, to me, the Japanese food has been a big step up in LA compared to New York. And I've been, uh, you know, I've had this big ramen kick, this ramen awakening, uh, and other Japanese foods like Japanese curry and these kinds of things. Like in New York, most of the Japanese food was just sushi, it was just sushi. And, you know, maybe like... Outside of the sushi menu, you'd see stuff like chicken teriyaki. But uh, the diversity and the breadth of Japanese food I've really been exposed to since coming to L.A. In general, I love the L.A. food scene. I think, I think you do end up spending more than what you do in New York. I do think everything can be a little bit too done up when you want kind of easy, quick, and casual uh, but, you know, both places are great. So that's kind of my answer. All right, Sports Fanatic. Favorite sports. This is a really on-brand question for the name of this account. Uh, favorite sports outside of tennis, and how often do you get to watch said other sports? Being that you are in the U.S., when the tennis is in Europe, it's usually over by midday, so you probably have some free time at night. Yeah, that's technically true. That is true. Um, however, my sports viewing has, or my sports knowledge, and I'm a really well-rounded sports fan. That is to say that I enjoy my hockey. Now, I'm usually just watching the Rangers. I don't watch random NHL games, but I watch a lot of my Rangers. Um, and I enjoy basketball. I enjoy the NBA. I love the NFL. Um, and... I really like baseball also. So I'm really well-rounded. Like I watch it all. Uh, but my knowledge has gone into the dumps completely. Just uh, really, I think the the college grind began that process. It took a lot of it out, out of me. I was uh, busy not only with all the tennis stuff, but all of the, the Syracuse stuff and, and calling games and doing a lot of stuff, you know, just outside the classroom, right? And then uh, video games have left my life, sports video games. I think that's a huge factor. The reason I knew random NHL players, random NBA players, Eastern Conference, Western Conference, doesn't matter. Um, the reason I knew these guys was because I was engaging with these sports outside of actually watching the sports. So video, I, you know, I was playing sports video games, um, and I, I really think that helps you just kind of learn all of the characters or familiarize yourself with all of them. And I'm just spread a lot more thin now. Uh, I'm sure this, you know, happens, I guess, to a, you know, a lot of people for various reasons. But also, you know, you make a good point about tennis being over by midday usually, but it is really quite consuming. You know, when it comes to like all of the time that I spend watching tennis, yes, maybe there aren't any sports on at the time, but like on a Sunday after I'm done watching the final, I'm worrying about Monday match analysis to try to get it out, you know, usually Sunday night so that come Monday morning in Europe and in the US, it's ready. So I'm like not watching football when I would be because I'm working on Monday Match Analysis. And there are tons of examples of that where uh, it, it does take a lot out of me because tennis is literally the most frequently happening sport in the world. There is no sport that has more sport than tennis. So it is very consuming. Oh, and by the way, if I'm working for Tennis Channel, after the tennis that ends in midday, I have to prep. So I'm prepping for tomorrow's broadcast. Uh, so the tennis isn't even over when the tennis is over. It's very consuming. Uh, and look, there's a give and take because five, six years ago, I was not as in on tennis. I was missing more outside of the majors. I was, I've always followed tennis. I've always been in the top, you know, 
five, ten percent of sports fans, really the top, like probably easily the top five percent of sports fans when it comes to viewing my tennis, watching my tennis. But I wasn't locked in every single week because I didn't have to be. I didn't have to be. So sometimes I I wouldn't watch the weeks after the majors, the two fifties. Now I'm usually working them. Now I'm usually after the major, before the major, 250s, I'm working for Tennis Channel. Now it's, you know, if it's a master or if it's a Grand Slam, I'm grinding on YouTube. So there, there are very few weeks where I'm not locked into the tennis world. And that takes away from the other sports. But um, yeah, I, I love the four American major sports and I love MMA. Those are the big ones. From Nomo. I'm going to start trying to go faster. If you record this after the France-Morocco semifinal, who will win the Football World Cup this Sunday? Uh, okay, so as of recording, France has defeated Morocco. I think Argentina is going to win. I don't like that France... I'm, I'm just going to... Look, I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about really, but I did watch both semifinal games in their entirety. And I thought that France-Morocco game should have been closer than 2-0. Uh, given the chances that Morocco had. Mbappe, you know, drew defenders, created some chances, but both France goals were off of, like, sh deflected shots that ended up working out perfectly. Uh, not to say that France didn't deserve the victory. I, I do think that they got probably the, the better of play slightly, but and <laughs> I'm laughing, by the way. I just, I can't take myself seriously just breaking down the soccer here. Um, but the fact that France has conceded in every game and I do think they gave up the number of chances they gave up against Morocco. I think they probably should have conceded um, at least a goal in this one. I just don't think their defense is stout enough to win this World Cup final. So I like Argentina. It's going to be fun. I can't wait. This is the most excited I've been for, uh, for a football game in a while. All right. Favorite retired basketball player of all time? That's a tough one. Um, I loved the Spurs when they had Manu, Tony Parker, Ginobili. And Tony Parker was my favorite player on that team. So Tony Parker is one, but I am a Knicks fan. And my favorite, like, old retired Nick, besides Mello, I feel like Mello is just a crappy answer. Uh, I'll say Jamal Crawford. Love Jamal Crawford. From Billy... Marilla, what's your album of the year? Now, this is interesting because my album of the year is uh, not from an artist on my Spotify wrapped. Yeah, it's not. Um, it's, uh, I think Beyonce's project was probably the best of the year. And when I first listened to it, I didn't think it was for me. Because I just didn't get it. I didn't like it. I didn't get it. I, then when I realized like, oh... This is music that is supposed to be played in the club. Like, you should be able to dance to this music. You should be able to play this music really loud in a dark club and, like, just come into it with that mindset and listen to it in that framework. And as soon as I opened my mind up to what it was, I was just blown away and still am blown away by by that Beyonce album, Renaissance. So I, I think that's my album of the year. Uh, do I, am I constantly bumping it? Am I constantly listening to it? No, I'm not. Cause I got to be in that mood. But when I am in that mood, that's my, that's my album of the year. From Anthony, who are some of your favorite commentators outside of tennis can be uh, current or from the past. Um, and then the second one from Anthony is what are some of your favorite non-tennis related channels on YouTube, which by the way, that's kind of how I, I don't really watch a lot of tennis channels on YouTube. I think I've said that in like the last mailbag. Um, favorite commentators outside of tennis. I miss Doc Emmerich on hockey. It's just outstanding. Just incredible. Mike Breen in basketball, Ian Eagle. I've said these guys uh, earlier. Uh, Kevin Harlan on the radio. I love Kevin Harlan on the radio. If you can listen to like Monday Night Football on Westwood One, for example. Um, who else? I mean, I love Mike Tirico. All the NFL guys, all the top NFL guys really do an awesome job for the most part. But yeah, I would say like my sentimental favorites are 
I don't know. I'm 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 a little biased also. You know, some of these guys like I and I know what an amazing guy he is. I and his son I'm really good friends with, um, Noah. So I mean, you know. I try not to like I'm kinda past the point of like trying to get you know, be a be a media critic. There was a point in time where I just loved all this stuff and all these thoughts are in my head, but like you you won't really find me like bashing people in the industry really at all. But obviously I'm totally fine praising um the names that I, you know, have just praised. Uh non tennis related channels on YouTube. Kenji Lopez Alt, not another cooking show. Ethan Schlebowski. Those are the food guys that I really like a lot. Uh, and then for music, I'm a, I'm a needle drop guy. I do love me some Anthony Fantano. And then car cars. I actually really like watching car reviews on YouTube. Uh, Savage Geese. Doug DeMuro sometimes. He's a lot. He's a lot. A lot to handle. Um, who else do I like? Straight Pipes. Those Canadian guys are hilarious. Who is your favorite New York Ranger ever? Uh, that would be Henrik Lundqvist. This puck back here, that guy, that puck is signed by Henrik Lundqvist. It was a gift. I, I'm not, and I was never a big memorabilia guy, but uh, that was a, a gift that I, I very much cherished uh, from one of my, my friends way back in elementary school. We were like best friends. We were really young. Uh, he got me that Henrik Lundqvist signed puck. I used to be superstitious as hell watching the Rangers. I would just hold on to that puck. Literally, I'd watch the Rangers hold on to the puck uh, like like they was they were going to lose if I didn't just clutch it uh, with, with everything I had. So yeah, definitely Lundqvist. I was always attracted to goalies. Uh, I wanted to be a goaltender. Uh, my parents who work tirelessly in full-time jobs, they were not about to make the sacrifices necessary to get me into ice hockey. I mean, in the United States, I'm sure, you know, in other countries, particularly Canada, it is not quite as brutal, uh, but ice time is so scarce that it's just tough. Like to get kids into hockey, you know, you're talking about waking up at 5 a.m. for practice and ice time on the weekends. It's just very, very cumbersome. Very cumbersome sport to get into. So I wanted to do it. My parents never really pushed me into it. But I wanted to be a goalie. I wouldn't have been a very good goalie because I'm not tall enough to be a good goalie. But why was I Why was I attracted to being a goalie? Why did I love goaltenders? Because same reason I love tennis. That responsibility. That one, that kind of, that singular individualism that comes with the job. I want the responsibility. I want the power. And, you know, that's what you get in tennis. That's what you get in goaltending. You know, you get all the pressure, all the blame, all the praise. That's that's how I was wired. All right, uh, from Twitter. <laughs> okay, I'm involved because I said on my tweet, I said reply to get involved. So uh, Cooper Cooper's Workshop is involved. Uh, how do you do this without asking for money? Simple. Well, first of all, I do accept donations of $2 a month. Becoming a member. Hit that join button. If you're viewing on your phone, you can't join. You have to go on your laptop to hit the join button. And then you become a member for $2 a month. That is how you support the channel. I am very grateful for all who do that. But how do I do this? Like without, I think you can probably sense from me that I've never been really, really desperate to maximize the monetization of what I do here. And that is true. That is accurate. And that is because I have never relied on this to support myself. You know, I, I, uh, I support myself through mainly tennis channel and some other stuff. But, you know, this is not my primary means of supporting myself. So that is why I have never had to worry that much uh, about how much money I'm making from this. However, uh, I you know would love to get to a point where uh, financially, you know, this uh, can can grow and, and elevate. Uh, I you know I'd be lying if I wasn't frank about that. But 
you know, it's never been the real reason why I do this. Would you join Nebula? This is from Anuj Beatles. And uh, what's your dream for this channel? Don't be afraid now. So I had never heard of Nebula. I saw this comment. I Googled it. Should I join Nebula? Like, explain to me why I should join Nebula. I'm happy to join Nebula if I should. Um, you know, I will be expanding my content onto some other platforms very soon. But I don't know about Nebula. But it's, you know, a streaming platform, apparently. Um, what's my dream for this channel? My dream for this channel is that I am working with a great team of people. People who are doing my social media. People who are helping me uh, make this look great graphically. People who are, you know, elevating the way this show looks. Um, you know, people who, who are helping me in certain ways. And the way that I build, you know, a great team of people would be if I... Uh, was able to, you know, have more resources to do that, uh, you know, financial resources, you know, because I, I, while I'm, you know, I would need, I would need things to grow a little bit more and I'm starting to take some steps towards that. Uh, but then ultimately, you know, my dream for the channel is that it continues to grow, obviously. In terms of like what it is in the grand scheme of my career, this is my ultimate base. This is my ultimate safety net. Uh, because you never know what's going to happen. You never know. But what I do know is I'll never get fired from this job. I'll never, I'll always have this. It doesn't matter what happens. And again, this is a crazy industry. Lots of things change. Lots of things happen. What I know is that the day I stop doing this is the day I decide to stop doing this. So if this becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, if we can grow these things and enter the, the lives of more tennis fans and enhance the experience of more tennis fans, which is ultimately the goal, is just to spread the love of the sport, spread the engagement of the sport through this kind of content. Uh, if we can do that and... I can give to tennis what Ariel Hawani gives to MMA, what Pat McAfee gives to NFL fans. Just for examples, Bill Simmons, Ryan Rosillo, right? Like if we can, and look, we won't get as big as that. It's just not, you know, that'll never be in the cards. But if we can go in that, towards that direction, uh, I will feel like, you know, like I'm set, like I'm fulfilled. Uh, from a career standpoint, because I'll always have that. Nobody can take it away from me because it's my own thing. It's mine. All right, let's try to get through these a little bit quicker. Uh, from Domination, as a reminder, okay, uh, do you have any thoughts on pickleball? It seems to get a lot of hate from many tennis players. Perhaps this is because tennis courts are being replaced by pickleball courts. Also, perhaps because pickleball is less athletic, which leads to elitist tennis players dissing the sport. However, I play both, and I think that pickleball is pretty cool and interesting, especially as a gateway into racket sports, which can be quite daunting. And then also from Jason, who is a member, appreciate that. Pickleball growth impact on tennis, recreational, and professional side. I'm still forming my opinion on pickleball. Sometimes you need to be able to say that. Uh, my gut is that they should be able to coexist, you know, like that's my first thing is that there shouldn't be this culture war, but I get it. You know, there, there have been tennis courts lost. There has been, you know, airtime lost, right? A big thing has been uh tennis channel, uh, showing pickleball. Like I get that. I get all that, but in theory, they should really be able to coexist. I don't know 
what the future of pickleball is as a spectator sport, but I know that there is a lot of excitement around playing pickleball. I know a lot of people who are into it, uh, and it is because it is so easy to get into. And that is a sport taking advantage of one of tennis's shortcomings. Tennis is, in my opinion, the greatest sport in the world. It is my number one. It is my favorite sport. There will never be anything like it. Uh, but that doesn't mean I can't call a spade a spade. Pickleball does something better than tennis, which is be accessible. It's not easy to be a, t a beginner in tennis. Not easy at all. And uh, Pickleball has capitalized on that, taken advantage of that. There's a lot of money coming in. There's a lot of big money, big investment coming into the sport. Uh, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, I have not played. I am going to play. It is on my list. And when I play, I'm going to make a video just explaining and describing my thoughts on what it was like to experience playing um, pickleball. Barbara, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Look, not for me, not for me, but you probably, you know, maybe from everything you've heard, how into food I am, the fact that I'm a New Yorker, you probably think I'm going to give this passionate, like, I should never be on a pizza. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not that guy. I'm not. I get it. Look, you know, it's sweet. It's salty. Like, like the ham is sweet, right? Ham isn't that far off from a lot of the other meat that we like to put on pizza. You know, salty meat like salamis and pepperonis and sausages. You know, ham's not that far off from that, all right? Now we go to pineapple. Uh, pineapple is delicious. And does it clash a little bit in theory with some of the ingredients that you, like, does it clash with marinara sauce? Not really, I almost, I get it. Like that's, I think the part that has people a little bit like, oh, you're going to put pineapple. Um, and I, I talk about ham because it's Hawaiian pizza. Uh, but like, I understand that pizza is salty from the cheese and the meat, and it's kind of acidic from the tomato sauce and pineapple just gives it that burst of sweetness. I get how that's satisfying for some people. Again, not for me, but whatever it's fine people like pineapple on pizza knock your socks off 